everybody. My name is Corey Alexander, and thanks for showing up and being here with me for Fire Dev Days. I'm going to talk about um, adventures in fire sinking and caching today. So let's get started. So I'm Corey Alexander. I'm a senior software engineer at Wellsheet. And uh, Wellsheet is reducing physician bur burnout and improving patient care through um, an EHR add-on that enables a modern user experience for clinicians. So instead of the old EHR um, user experiences, we are letting clinicians use much better UIs to uh, improve patient care. So let's talk about fire resources and how we get the data that we need to display for all these clinicians. Uh, so let's start in the beginning. In some of these prototype versions of Wellsheet, um, we load the data directly for a clinician on um, request. So when a clinician goes to look at a chart, we talk directly with the Fire APIs to the EHR and get the data to display for that clinician. Um, and this works awesome. Our clinicians are happy. We can look at specific charts and get all of their information. And uh, clinicians really like the UIs we're able to provide on top of their EHR. Um, gives them a better experience altogether. Um, and it also works great when you look at multiple charts. Um, you can go back and forth between multiple patients and get data directly from the EHR. Uh, this worked great for us for a long time, at least in the prototype stages, and allowed us to iterate really fast. Um, but we did notice a slight issue with this, and what we found clinicians do day to day is they often go between a set of patients. They don't just see one patient, they might see multiple, and they might want to refer to the charts for patients um, kind of like one after another. And when we were loading data right on demand, this caused a slight issue because the second time our doctor doctor here would look at a patient, he'd have to wait for all the data to come back from the Fire APIs again. And this led to slow load times and uh, wasn't the user experience we were trying to provide for these clinicians. So caching. Caching is the first thing we did to solve this problem. So instead of going and getting the data direct from the Fire APIs, we did it in our Wellsheet server. So in our server, what we were able to do is cache this data in our SQL database. We use SQL for all of our other application data, so it made perfect sense to start caching in SQL as well. So let's look at that example again, but now thinking about with caching in our database. So we have our clinician, and let's say they look at this patient first. They request this patient in Wellsheet. We talk with the EHR over the Fire APIs. And as we return the data to the client with the visualizations, we also store the data in our cache. Now let's say the doctor moves on to their second patient. We, they request the data, we get it from the Fire APIs, and then again, we cache it in our database and return the visualization to the user. And then here's where things get interesting. The next time they go back to that first patient, we don't have to talk through the Fire APIs anymore. We already have this data in our cache. So this improved the user experience for this doctor tremendously because now we can show it to them almost immediately without having to go back to the EHR to request all this data again. But that first load, the first time this clinician looked at the patient was still a bit slow. We wanted to see if we could speed this up because doctors didn't, we don't, we don't want doctors to be waiting in front of these screens. We want them to be talking and treating patients. So this is how our fetches from the EHR looked initially. They were kind of this waterfall. We would fetch some res we would just fetch the resources one after the another. We usually started with patient and then maybe encounter, and then we grabbed all the other resources we need to render our pages. But this took a long time and led to clinicians not getting the speed up we, we wanted to give them in terms of how they browse the data. And we realized we could probably parallelize this. We could run these fetches in parallel and not have to wait on each one to finish before starting the next one. And that's where we went. But let's actually take a step back from parallelization for just a second and talk about some of these fire resources in general and how they play together. So here's just an assortment of different fire resources. Uh, these are not all the ones we use, but they're definitely some of the ones that we use to um, render the displays we need. And this is kind of like unstructured here. We see there's not really like an order to these, but we can give them more of a structure and more of an order. We can group them kind of like this. We've, we've made this tree or graph shape here. Um, and we found that this, this helps us think about the resources and we'll get back to parallelizing them in a second. So the first thing we're able to think about really is the patient. 
And then under that, there's things that we want to associate to the patient. A patient has some encounters and they were immunized. And then there's something that we want to relate to the encounter. Um, medications that were prescribed during this encounter or documents that were created during this encounter. Um, and then there's maybe even more levels. To understand a binary, we really need to understand the document reference that it came from. And we realized that using this, we could do the parallelization a bit better. The first thing we could get is patient. And that kind of unlocked the next level of immunization and encounter. And so on down the tree. Once we get immunization and encounter, we open up document reference, medication, observation, and condition. And we can just go through from there. Finishing document reference now allows us to think about that binary because we know about the document references attached to, and we can finish off our tree. So how does this fit back with parallelization? So this is parallelization like we saw in the first slide. We try to do everything at once. But like we just saw with the resources, we don't really, we can't really do all of them at once. A binary doesn't make sense without its document reference, and that doesn't make sense without an encounter, and maybe the patient. So we can't do everything at once. But here's what we can do. We can use this tree and the levels in the tree to parallelize um, a lot more than we could before, if not all the way. So we start with the top level. We can do patient first. And once we get patient, we can do that second level in parallel. We can do encounter and immunization at the same time. Once we get through this level, we can do the third level in parallel. We can do procedure, medication, observation, and condition. So this helped us speed up the time to first sync by quite a bit. In this example, we have seven resources. And in the old waterfall style, this was going to be seven consecutive levels of fetching. But now that we've parallelized, we've been able to reduce that to only three layers of fetches, greatly speeding up, cutting in almost half the time it takes to view a chart from start to finish. So are we done? We've talked about caching and parallelization, and th these helped us get massive wins for our clinicians. But we aren't done quite yet. We skipped a big important problem. Um, in computer science and in the experience that we were we were developing here, and that's cache invalidation. How do we know what was or wasn't stored in our SQL database so we know when to go back to the EHR and get data? Let's take a look at some examples. So let's say we have our doctor doctor, and they're going to look at this patient. And then some time's going to pass. Maybe they're going to go home, go to bed, and come back the next day, and they want to see this patient again. If we just loaded the data from our cache, this doctor would be sad. He wouldn't see the new data from the last 24 hours, and this poses real significant risks to their workflows. So we couldn't have that. So what can we do? How can we remember what we've synced and shown a clinician so that when they look at that same data, we can break, we can look at it, we can use our cache, but if they look at different data, we can fetch it from the EHR. Our first version of this was to store something we like to call the last sync app. When was the last time we went to the EHR and got updated data? With this concept, if a clinician requested newer data than we had, we could just move this line and know to sync again. We had already synced the data before it, but we had to move it up to get the new data. That works great in one direction, but what if we go the opposite direction? What if this clinician wants to look at old data, something we totally support in Wellsheet? This is a common flow to figure out the history of a patient and why they might be there for this visit. But if we just store one end of when we last synced, we either have to assume all of past, all of the past is something we already have in our cache, or we can, or our doctor is going to make decisions based on less information than they should. Are there no encounters in 2015 because there are really no encounters or because we just haven't synced them from the EHR yet? That posed a big risk and a problem. So how can we iterate from that? Well, instead of storing just the last sync at, we can kind of bookend our timeline with a synced from and a synced until. The synced from is usually the oldest piece of data we found in our current syncs. And the synced until is either the newest piece of data or the last time we synced. This allows us to move in either direction. We can look at more recent data and only move the synced until. And we can look at older data than we currently have and only move the sync from. So this allows us to keep track of what data we have in our cache and what data we don't 
allowing us to intelligently know when to go back to the EHR and when we don't need to. But we're not quite done yet. In Wellsheet, we have different views of the data. We have two main ones that we're going to talk about today. We have a list view and a chart view. And in the list view, you're not looking at just one patient. You're looking at a few of them, a list of them. Our most common use case for this is a team of clinicians um, having a list of the patients they're responsible for. These list views don't have all the data that, they, that we have in the chart view. They don't need to show everything about the patient, just a few key bits of information. So let's look at it with just one time, with a single timeline like we just talked about. And let's say the first thing that our doctor does is he wants to go to the chart view. The, our first option is we can just load all of the data we need no matter which view you go to. So if you go to the chart view first, we're going to load all your data. We're going to do a synced from and synced until on our timeline. And then if you go to the list view, you're great. You already have that data in the cache, so it's nice and fast. But what if we do the opposite direction? What if we start with the list view? And now you can see all those dark orange are the resources that we're going to sync because we just have to do everything, but we don't actually need for the list view. So the doctor is going to wait unnecessarily for resources that aren't applicable to their view at all. They are going to get all the data eventually. And if they move to the chart view, it'll all already be cached, but they don't necessarily need to do that. Can we make this a little better? What if we created two timelines, one for each view, one for the list view and one for the chart view? Now, if you go to the list view, we only can request the things we need for the list view and fill in our timeline. But then if you go to the chart view, we already fetched patient and encounter for you on the list view. But since these timelines are separate, we don't know that and we have to fetch it again. This is going to, again, get the right data, but it's going to take more time for this clinician, something we're trying to avoid. Okay, so what if we didn't create a timeline per view, but we created a timeline per resource? So for each patient, we might have multiple of these timelines, one for each resource. And we can fill them in um, as needed. Maybe some resources we have different slots of data than the other just based on the views or usage that we've seen. But being able to do this by resource allows us to achieve some better performance than we were able to without it. Let's take a look at an example again. Let's say our clinician starts with the list view again. And we're going to load patient and encounter. But as you see, we know about patient and encounter on their own timelines. So when we fill them in, we know they're filled in even in the chart view that we haven't even loaded yet. And when you go to the chart view, what you need to sync is only the remaining resources. We've already got patient and encounter and we have, they have their own timelines. So everything, all the resources are completely separate or can be completely separate. Now we can just sync observation procedure and medication, fill in those timelines and show you the chart view. No extra weighting on either side, no matter which view you start with. So this was a brief tour of the different syncing strategies we've used at Wellsheet to make clinicians' life easier. We developed different caching and parallelization strategies to reduce the amount of time it takes to view a chart for a clinician. I hope you guys enjoyed this talk today. Um, you can reach out to me during dev days. I'll be in the speaker gallery answering any questions you have. You can also shoot me an email at Corey at Wellsheet.com. And I'm available on Twitter at Corey, J under Corey J A underscore dev. Wellsheet is also hiring across engineering, product, and design. So feel free to reach out to me directly to chat about opportunities we might have at Wellsheet or check out our website for more information. Thanks. I hope you guys have a great rest of your week at Dev Days, and I can't wait to talk to you guys more soon. Thanks. Bye. Hey, everybody. This is Melinda from HL7. I am going to allow you all to unmute yourselves if you would like to ask a question. Corey, are you there? Yep, I am here. How's it going, everyone? Thanks for tuning into the talk. So we've had some questions asked in the speaker gallery and I have tried to answer them live as they've come in. Um, I can read off some of those and chat through the answers if we wanna start there or if anyone else has other questions they didn't leave.
I'll give you guys a few seconds to jump in now. Okay, so let's go through some of the questions that have been left in the speaker gallery app. Uh, so the first question was about listening to HL7 v2 messages. Um, do you listen to those to understand what information is available to fetch? I mean, we don't do that today, though that's definitely something we are um, considering and something we want to do in the future. Um, that would definitely help us not necessarily need to go try. We might know whether the data is going to be fresh or not, and that's definitely something um, we're looking into. Um, Another question was, do you cache the native fire resource JSON before ingesting it into SQL? Um, and we have done this in the past where we've stored the JSON directly. Um, and we found that for our usages, we had just limited use of the JSON in um, the raw form before ingesting it into SQL. So we currently just cache the um, ingested SQL versions. Hey, Corey, I see a couple of new ones popped in the chat here. Ooh, fun. Let's yeah. check those ones out. Sometimes you have to refresh from to show up, but they just kind of all popped in at once. That's fair. Let's see. Okay, yeah. So there's some new ones here. Um, did you consider trying include or rev include to reduce total number of queries requested for each fire server? Um, and yes, we are doing that for some specific resources that um, we've found to support it. I definitely don't think we have um, exhausted this, I think we definitely could do more of including to reduce the number of queries. Um, it's something that was a little hard to do given some of the architecture decisions we had made at some point, but it's definitely something we are um, moving towards and trying to use. Um, oh, the same question again, for parallel requests, did you consider using the include parameter? And um, we do for some things, but have not um, used that across the board for everything. Um, did you make use of the Fire GraphQL interface for querying Fire servers? Um, and no, we do not at all make use of the GraphQL interface. And that is something that we should definitely look into. Um, that could actually, you know, along the same lines of the include questions from down below could really definitely increase or decrease the number of queries we need. Um, I'm definitely going to look into that here after this conference. Thank you for um, the question. Um, and how are you potentially dealing with duplicate or contra contradictory data points from different EHRs presented to the user? Um, so this is a thing that we're tackling very, very right now, actually, kind of. Um, and currently, we don't have a, a display for doctors that is inter-EHR. We have some doctors that can connect to two different EHRs. Um, and we are working on giving that combined view now, um, but haven't solved that quite yet. That's one of the hurdles we are um, actively working on. Let me refresh and see if there are more questions that I have now missed. Um, how do you maintain display to the user providence information about different data points? Um, I'm not sure exactly what you're asking here, Adolf, um, but if you would follow up with a clarification, I would love to answer offline. Um, let's see here. How do you identify if the cache has the latest data? For example, if the patient info got updated after caching. Uh, so we do that with the timelines that I mentioned in the second half. So. We won't know, we always have to go ask the fire servers for information. Um, and then once we ask, we'll fill in the timeline knowing when the latest data we grabbed was. Um, so we don't know without asking if we have the latest data, we can just tell you we have data up until let's say 10 minutes ago. Um, and then we go and ask the fire servers and see if there is new data and update the timelines that we keep accordingly. So before we ask, we don't, know 100% if we have the latest data. So we always will go ask. Um, do you perform your queries and caching across different EHRs? I um, mean, we do integrate with multiple EHRs, but we currently don't, um, we don't, we don't query across the EHRs and the caches are um, segregated um, along the same lines since the EHRs are separate. We um, don't do any cross EHR caching at the moment. 
Okay, well, that's all I see in chat right now, and we are at time. So, Corey, thank you very much for that awesome presentation, and I loved your uh, video skills there. That was great. Thank everybody for joining us today, and if you can just please rate your session within Whova, we'd appreciate it. Thanks much.